Good morning. Good morning and welcome to Garner E. Free. If you'd stand and we can worship, worship together. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder work in, in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder work in, in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from the passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing on Calvary's side. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder work in, in the blood of the Lamb. Precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be wider, much wider than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in its life giving glow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you with daily his praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. In the precious blood of the Lamb, in the precious blood of the Lamb. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, everybody. Good to see everybody here this morning. Um, it is cold, but um, the sun's shining, and it's, it's nice to have everybody here um, to worship one another, uh, with one another. A few announcements we've got here. Um, there's a Super Bowl uh, party tonight here at the church, so if you're interested, that starts at uh, 5 o'clock. Um, there's going to be pizza, um, also a free, free will offering. Um, uh, we ask if you do come just to bring a snack to share with everyone, um, and if you could uh, let Brooke Bonzi or Tanya Akins know if you're coming, just so they have enough pizza um, for everyone that's, that's going to be there. Um, serving with God's Pantry, um, it's an excellent way for people um, th to serve the, the need of people that, that need food in this community and share God's love and the gospel. Um, it's another opportunity just to serve outside of uh, the church building here. Um, in the bulletin, there is an insert that talks more about that, and if you have questions, you can contact Don or Pat Teeter with those as well. All right, so again, who likes pizza? Um, I think this is um, Dan. Yep, Dan's raising his hand. Dan and Elizabeth Baxter. Um, they uh, are going to provide pizza on February 21st. Um, they'll be having pizza for lunch here uh, following the service. We just ask that uh, for a free will offering um, to help cover the cost of the pizza. Um, if you have questions, again, Dan or Elizabeth, I'm sure could help you with, uh, with any answers you need to those. 
Um, an update on the pastor of Youth and Family Ministries. Um, so um, I think, Todd, didn't we, we mentioned this last week as well, correct? Yep. So again, um, Jesse Thompson and his wife, Carissa, will be here uh, February 20th and 21st. Um, there is an insert in your bulletin as well that explains all of this. Um, we'd love to have as many people here as we can, of course, to get, to, uh, get a chance to um, meet him and his wife um, and get to know them a little bit. Um, below is a tentative schedule for that weekend, so I'll just real roughly go over this. Saturday, um, on Saturday the 20th at 5.30 to 7.30, um, there's going to be a youth kind of mixer at the church for 5th through 12th graders. Um, Saturday uh, the 20th again at 7.30 to kind of an open-ended time um, will be a high school youth gathering uh, or get-together um, at uh, the Bightonworth. Jeff and Loretta have uh, opened their house to um, be willing to offer their, the space in their home for that. Um, and it'll be more specific to high school youth, um, but we'd love to have any of uh, the kids in that age bracket attend that as well um, to get a good feel for um, how Jesse does and uh, how he works specifically with kids of that age as well. Um, Sunday the 21st, uh, Jesse and Carissa will join us for worship and fellowship after the service. Um, and so that would be a great time, again, that um, you could introduce yourself um, as well, get to know them uh, briefly a little bit um, before um, uh, they take off for um, back to Kansas City uh, later in the day. Then again, in the bulletin, if the, you would like to see more on that, there's, there's an insert in there as well. Uh, the missionaries of the month, uh, Ken and Deb Quinnis, um, just continue to pray for them. Um, we pray that there's a continued process um, of our men's ministry, the Freedom Fighters, to become, um, to become its own nonprofit ministry organization for future ministry. So keep Deb and uh, Ken in your prayers. Um, the boxes um, for, are available for tithing. There's a couple options. Um, option one, you can mail a check in to the address on the screen. And then there's option number two, um, sign up for e-tithing um, and do it uh, just from your computer. A little bit uh, more streamlined and simple option. Yes? Okay. Okay. So you're saying, yeah, even if you're not missing something, if you just want a nice item, go, go grab it. <laughs> okay. Well, I need some new slippers, so I might go digging around, but yeah. So, yeah. Um, let's all stand and read the fighter verse together, if you would. This is from Psalms 56, 3 through 4. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you, in God whose word I praise, in God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? Please pray with me. Lord, as I said earlier, I thank you so much that you've given us um, this opportunity to come together with your fellow believers and to worship and praise your name. And along with that, learn more um, through the message today um, and, and from your word, Lord. Um, we are thankful um, that you have blessed us um, with, with the cold weather. I know it seems crazy to, to say that that's a blessing, Lord, but uh, you work all things for good, and I think there's blessing in, in it, uh, Lord. Lord, I thank you that um, <clears throat> I thank you that you have given us the opportunity um, to uh, to to hear a message again from Sam today, Lord, and I pray that that uh, lays heavy on the hearts um, of everyone here, and that it doesn't just uh, stay here at the church, but Lord, as they go out, that they they build upon that and they extend the church beyond uh, just these doors, Lord, um, out into Garter and uh, and beyond. Um, Lord, I pray for Ken and Deb Quinnis um, and their ministry, Lord. I pray that it's fruitful and that, um, <clears throat> and that everything comes straight from you, Lord, um, that, that they wouldn't get in the way, as, as with all of us as Christians, Lord, that we don't get in the way of the message you are trying to portray. We are just simply the hands and feet of it, Lord, and, um, and help us to, to remember that, Lord. Um, I pray for the, uh, those that attend the party tonight for the Super Bowl, um, that um, everyone is able to get here safely and enjoy um, more time and fun fellowship with one another, um, and that uh, it concludes um, a nice weekend for, for everyone that is there. Um, as we go forward, Lord, throughout this week, 
Um, again, like I said, I just pray that um, we are a witness for Christ throughout um, wherever we go, whether it be our jobs or on a vacation or just simply at our homes or wherever, Lord. Um, help us to be a true witness and to shine your light, Lord, in a world that really is struggling in so many ways and is, it's so dark. Um, help us to, to be a bright light um, uh, shining forward in that, Lord. Um, we thank you for, again, this opportunity, Lord, and the fact that you, you are always there for us, the solid rock that we can continue to lean on, um, no matter if things are going good or going bad. Um, we pray this all in your name. Amen. Amen. If you'd remain standing, we will continue our time of worship. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in, oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Oh, the sun sets free, oh, it's free. He has ransomed me, his grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. Who the sun sets free, always free.
to be a sanctuary. Pure and holy, tried and true. Lord, we thank you that we can freely worship you in this country and that we have the opportunity to p- declare you king up here. Um, Lord, just pl- please keep that attitude of worship in our hearts throughout the rest of this week. 
and as we go throughout our lives. And just let us to be that, that light that shines in this, in this community. Lord, it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, worship team. This time we'll be passing the baskets for the time of offering. If you would just continue passing the baskets all the way down to the end, across the aisles, and we'll pick them up on, the, on that side. Good morning. I think I have a different uh, microphone pack, and the red light is on instead of a green light, and that might not mean anything. But if it does, now you know. I hope you don't mind, but I brought my yield sign back. Is that subtle enough? <laughs> and I don't know if, if somebody needs this thing to advance the scripture. You're going to need it, especially for the scripture this morning. I may have mentioned in one of the previous weeks by the way, I, I just want to say thank you as well for the opportunity to administer God's word all these weeks. And uh, as you guys take the next step in your journey with uh, Dr. Wick coming, I'll be around in case he takes vacation or gets a cold or something. But um, in my years of pastoring, I pointed out that uh, although you see me up here speaking, I don't see you. I see a mirror because what the Lord is dealing with me on, then I pass that along. And today is no exception to that. Uh, some people think, you know, that preacher, he's, he's up there lecturing everybody else and he's got it all together. Well, this preacher doesn't, not even close. Which is also why I like to start with prayer. Let's do that as we begin. Heavenly Father, I certainly recognize my unworthiness to deliver this message from your word and you put it here for a reason and we best not neglect it so as we approach your book your holy word through your spirit, speak to us very plainly, very clearly. In Jesus' name, amen. As you read through the Gospels, and I hope you are doing that, 
you'll discover many, many remarkable encounters. How could you not? Right? After all, these books chronicle the earthly life and ministry of God in the flesh. What would truly be amazing is if these books were filled with mundane encounters. No, when Jesus is on the scene, look out, something remarkable is about to happen. Frequently, such encounters involve some miraculous work by Jesus on someone's behalf. But also often, and more often than you may think, it simply involved a conversation that Jesus had with someone. Think woman at the well or Nicodemus, even Governor Pilate. One such encounter is so significant it is recorded in three of the four Gospels. So if you have your milk jug, take it and turn to Matthew 19. Matthew 19, and when you find that, put a little marker in and turn to Mark chapter 10. And when you find that, put a little marker in that and turn to Luke chapter 18. I call God's word a milk jug because the Apostle Peter, in 1 Peter 2, 2 says, as newborn babes crave pure spiritual milk, the milk of the word. And I just happen to really, really enjoy milk, so that resonates with me, that God's word is sustenance. Those three passages I mentioned, what I've done and what will be up on the screen is I've taken all three and kind of blended them together. So what I'm going to read won't be in any one of those three. It'll be all three kind of mashed up. That's why it's on the screen. Now a certain ruler ran up to Jesus and fell on his knees and asked, Good teacher, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. Why do you ask me about what is good? If you want to enter life, obey the commandments. Which ones? He replied, Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not lie or defraud, honor your parents, and love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept since I was a boy, the man said. What do I still lack? Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you still lack, Jesus replied. If you want to be perfect, go. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and then you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. When the young man heard this, his face fell, and he went away sad because he had great wealth. Only one can occupy our life's throne. Just one. Co-regents, that's two or more occupying a throne, don't work for long. Kingdoms throughout time have tried that. Usually it was a brief period of time when a father was kind of handing off the kingdom to one of his children. When there is no heir apparent, the struggle begins. And even when occupied, a struggle to retain the throne goes on. That's what we'll find beneath the surface of this encounter between Jesus and a certain nameless man. And its relevance for us today is found in the fact that no one, please hear this, no one can ever be saved from hell without following Jesus' instructions given in this dialogue. So let's observe three unfolding stages of this tragedy and make no mistake it is a tragedy what happened here the first stage is anticipation anticipation and this is seen first of all in the approach we call this guy the rich young ruler and this is from information gleaned from these three accounts it's Matthew's gospel that tells us he was young it is Luke that tells us that he was a ruler and all three of them mention his wealth and it says that he ran up to Jesus ran up there's there's a bit of urgency here you know Jesus was on the move he was traveling around and if you wanted to see Jesus you you had to you know have a strategy 
years ago, many years ago, I was at the straw poll with my oldest child. This was before the 2000 election. There were a whole bunch of Republican candidates. Ames hosted that, that uh, poll back then. And we were at, I believe it was Gary Bauer's tent. There were tents set up, people everywhere by the, uh, the Coliseum there at Ames. And I said to my daughter, wow, that looks just like Reggie White. If you don't know who Reggie White is, he's a uh, Hall of Fame standout uh, defensive end for, well, the Green Bay Packers. And, uh, and she said, you know, I think that is him. So we were like, whoa, we got to meet this guy. But he was you know, busy, and he'd go to do interviews, and, and we were always trying to catch up with him. Oh, Mr. White, Mr. White. I don't know if he could hear us, but he had a place to go. So we realized the way to get to meet him is we got to get in front of him because then he'd have to run us over to get where he's going. He's a big guy. Could have ran us over and not even noticed, probably. Anyway, it, it happened. We orchestrated it, and it happened, and we got our picture taken with him. So uh, th this gentleman, he ran. He ran up to Jesus. He fell on his knees. Show of respect, but even humility. This guy's a ruler, and he fell on his knees and addressed him, good teacher, another show of honor. I believe he came with sincerity and not in, in pretense. Think the Pharisees, all those teachers of the law. They were constantly trying to trip up Jesus. Constantly. Their little gotcha questions. They came with pretense. Jesus always saw through it and uh, turned it back on their heads. But this guy, I believe, was very sincere. He was looking for the right thing, and he was looking at the right place. This anticipation is seen not only in his approach, but also in his appeal. What good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? Isn't that what we are hoping and waiting for someone to come up and ask us? That doesn't happen very often. Somebody just walks up and says, hey, by the way, what would I have to do to get to heaven? I was just curious about that. Well, we would hope that somebody would ask that. And he didn't ask, how can I inherit eternal life? He asked, what thing must I do? So this sort of, he assumed that there was something that he was going to have to do. Reveal perhaps a work-based scale model. I mentioned that a few weeks ago. You know, I've got to outweigh the bad with the good, so there must be something I can do that's going to really tip the scales my way. Jesus cleared up a few points from the start. He pointed out that only God is good. Why do you call me good? Only God is good. So by addressing him as good, he was unintentionally perhaps recognizing Jesus' deity. Good teacher. Then that's, I'm God. I am a good teacher. I'm God in the flesh. And then Jesus used the Old Testament law exactly the way that we should use it to expose the man's need for his Savior. There's 613 commands in the Old Testament for a reason. Because you can't keep them all. You can't keep half of them. You can hardly keep any of them. You just take the top ten that we call. That's why that law was given. To just lead us to frustration and to a Savior. I can't do this. What? I got to do that and 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 heavy, heavy load. I need help. I need a Savior. The law can't save. Never could. Never will. Couldn't save Moses. Couldn't save the children of Israel. Wasn't designed to do that. It's like the MRI machine. I don't know how many of you don't raise your hand. Have had that wonderful experience of the MRI machine. It has but one purpose, to identify the problem. That's all it can do. You will never hear someone say, yeah, I've got cancer, so I have to go get my MRI treatment. They put me in that tube. No, nope. you can just lay in that tube all day. You can lay in that tube all year. It's not going to get you better. All it can do is show you where the problem is. 
and there's other treatment that'll hopefully take care of that. That was the law. And it does a really good job of pointing out <laughs> what the problem is, by the way. So this guy says, which ones? The 613 commands. Which ones? What? Wait, what? Which ones? And Jesus was very, very polite. Did I hear someone say all of them? Yes. Jesus was polite. So he just pulled out five or six or seven, depending on which of those gospels you read it from. I almost wonder if he felt that as this young man that some of these commands were just incidental and not worthy of obedience. I don't know. Jesus mentions the biggies. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't do those. But also he mentions the ones that we consider trivial. Bearing false witness, lying. Dishonoring parents, disobedience. The man should have replied, I'm guilty. I'm guilty. Which leads us to the second stage, the rationalization. Rationalization. This is seen in his reply. With a straight face, he looked right at Jesus and said, I kept all those since I was a boy. Really? And of course, Jesus, he could have just started mentioning certain episodes in the guy's life. Isn't that what he did with the woman at the well? You're correct in saying you have no husbands. You've had five husbands, and the one you have now isn't your husband. And she's like, whoa, he's on to me. Amazing. You've never lied with young people and children. <laughs> Again, you don't have to raise your hand. So how many of you have never lied? It's amazing how many people raise their hand. <laughs> Little kids, I've never lied. Well, you just did. <laughs> Never disobeyed parents. Here is self-deception aided by rationalization. Could it be he was downplaying his own sin? Yeah. And he followed that up with, what do I still lack? I've been there. I kept all those. Maybe there's something else. It, maybe there's a 614th commandment that I missed. What is it? Help me out. And... To his credit, he was prepared to make some sort of sacrifice. He wouldn't have asked these questions if he wasn't prepared to, to do something. He came expecting to have some task to fulfill. This is reminiscent, by the way, of a, an account in the Old Testament. There was the, uh, the Syrian king had a uh, commander, Naaman, and Naaman was a leper, and so the king sent him to Elisha. First he sent him to the king. You can read the story. It's in uh, 1 Kings 5. But anyway, eventually he gets to Elisha, and Elisha doesn't even come out and see him. He sends his servant out and says, oh, yeah, you want to be cleansed? Go dip yourself seven times in the Jordan. Okay, later, bye. And, and Naaman, the commander, is offended. Ugh, the muddy Jordan? That's it? That's what I have to do? You know, we got better rivers where I come from. And he didn't want to do it. And if it wasn't for his servant saying, look, if the guy had said, go kill a lion or go, you know, defeat some city, you'd have done it in a heartbeat. So go dip seven times. What's the big deal? He did, of course, and he was healed. We must wonder what he expected Jesus to say. But this rationalization is also seen in the response. Jesus says, one thing you lack. Oh, you're so close. You're almost there. One thing, which is actually five things. He says, go, sell, give, come, and follow. Go, sell all you have, give to the poor, then come and follow me. And we'll all be good. So the question has to be asked, why was Jesus making it harder? Why was Jesus piling on? There's something going on here. 
Jesus knew that this man, like all of us, must, please hear me, must, all capitals, underline, bold type, must face the full guilt of our sin. We have to because we can't be saved unless we are sinners. Think of other encounters where the person admitted guilt right away. Jesus knew in this case he had to press farther. Look at Zacchaeus. Look what Zacchaeus had to do to try to arrange a meeting with Jesus. He had to climb a tree <laughs> to get up there. But, you know, he felt the weight of his sin. He and Jesus says, I'm going to your house and, and keep reading. And when they get to his house, what is Zacchaeus says, I repent. I, everything I've taken, I'm going to give back for the amount. He did it publicly. Jesus didn't need to pile on anything. The woman taken adultery in John 8. She was totally humiliated, to, totally weighed. The, the weight of her sin crushed her. Jesus didn't need to pile on. He said, go and sin no more. No one's condemning you. I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. But this guy was a little, little harder sell. Jesus tailored his teaching to expose the true motives of those seeking him. Jesus was a crowd thinner. He was. Uh, in the outline there in the bulletin, look up these passages. We're going to look at them all, but just look them up and see when there's a crowd what Jesus says. He's always saying things that make them stop and evaluate. I, I will ask you to turn to one, and that's in John chapter 6. This is the day after the feeding of the 5,000 in John 6. The next day, their stomachs were growling. They were hungry again. So they tracked down Jesus and tried to figure out a way to get him to make another meal. Again, you can read it quite a long chapter. But in the context, Jesus goes right to the point and says, listen, you guys are hungry for bread. I'm the bread of life. I'm, I'm the one. Okay, you eat that other bread like I gave yesterday, you're going to be hungry. That's why you're here right now. But the bread I give, you'll never hunger again. And they're like, oh, good. Yeah, okay, we'll take that bread. Give us some. And he goes on to describe this. What he's talking about is that you have to consume him. You have to, you have to take him. And the more he talked, the more puzzled they were. And the more he talked, the more upset they were. And you get to verse 60. I just want to read these verses. On hearing this, after Jesus unloaded the entire cart, basically saying, you need, you need me. On hearing this, many of his disciples, not just the crowd that was looking for a free meal, his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said, does this offend you? What if you see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Yet some of, there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which one of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, this is why I told you, no one can come to me unless the Father enables him. Verse 66, from this time many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Now, if Jesus was, was uh, attending a leadership seminar, he would be told, don't you ever say that. Don't drive people away. What are you thinking? He turned and looked to the 12 and said, do you want to leave also? And of course, Simon Peter is the one that speaks up. He was so often the spokesman for the group. Not that he was elected to that position, but he just, he, he would say what everybody else was thinking, so it worked out good. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. What is in that answer? Did Peter say, oh yeah, this is not a hard teaching. Oh, we got this figured out. No problem. Cakewalk. No, he's... 
We don't get this. We don't understand it. But we know that you are the Messiah. You're the only one. And maybe we'll, we'll get it later. But we're not leaving you, even if we don't get it, even if it bugs us. Jesus, the crowd thinner. You see, he wasn't making it harder. He sought to drive his hearers to despair so that Jesus is the only way. Why? Because he is the only way. And he had to get those hearers to that point, that point of frustration. He presented the true gospel, and here it is. You might want to write this down. Maybe you've heard it before. Total, unconditional surrender. That's the gospel. Jesus died for us, guilty sinners, and he demands but one thing, total and unconditional surrender. But today's gospel is void of contrition, that sorrow over sin. We don't see that. It's void of repentance, forsaking sin. And it's replaced by words repeated without consideration. You say, wait a minute, are you saying there's no place for the sinner's prayer? Of course there is. But it must involve the whole person. Eyes wide open indicate a change of attitude leading to a change of action. I use both. I used the sinner's prayer when I was four years old. I mentioned that a few weeks ago. The get out of hell version. But the Jesus, I'm yours prayer, that's the one where there was a change in my life version at age 11. The bottom line of this dialogue was control. Who's going to sit on that throne? Jesus wanted the throne of this man's life, but it was occupied, in this case, by his wealth. Side note here, Jesus was not saying that wealth is evil. Some people try to twist that. You read in the gospel, especially Luke 8, wealthy people supported Jesus in his ministry. Even, even documents who they were. That they were with him and they supported these guys. Good grief, they had this entourage traveling all over the place. He didn't, you know, multiply bread for every meal. But he definitely said that wealth is an obstacle. So true. Back in Mark's account, we find out this was a deal breaker. The guy went away sad. Is Jesus saying, I have to sell all my stuff to be saved? Some of you might have been thinking that. Most people that look at this passage do ask that question. Wait, do I have to sell all my stuff? Well, wait a second. What if he is? What if he is saying that? Well, now, wait a minute. Okay, well, again, here we go. That's why he said it to this guy. Is that a problem if he did say that? Is that a deal breaker if he did say that? Look at the response of the disciples. Now, they're... they're not eavesdropping, but they're in the, the fringe of this conversation. They're listening to the whole thing. Again, Mark 10, 23. Jesus looked around and said to the disciples how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. That means all their jaws clunk, 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 hit the ground. Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Verse 26, the disciples were even more amazed. They got those jaws up and then chunk, 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 they went back down again. Oh, well, who can be saved then? Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible. Not with God. With God, all things are possible. And Peter again speaks up. We've left everything to follow you. Kind of wanted to Make sure Jesus remembered that. We've left everything to follow you. I tell you the truth, Jesus replied, no one who has left home, brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, children, fields, for me in the gospel, will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, and with them persecution, and in the age to come, eternal life. Many who are first will be last, and the last first. 
wait, what did he just say? That we'll receive a hundred times? So I left my home, I'm going to have a hundred homes? You know, any, any believer in Christ who has a hundred homes? Or a hundred fields? Maybe if they're small fields. But wait, who has a hundred brothers? I don't have any sisters, by the way. But in Christ, apparently, I'm going to have a hundred of them. And a hundred mothers and a hundred fathers. How is this possible? Well, turn real quickly to Acts chapter 4, and I'll show you how this is possible. This, this was lived out less than three months after Jesus ascended. Acts chapter 4, verse 32. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions were his own, but they shared everything they had. Jump down to verse 34. There were no needy persons among them, for from time to time those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money to, of the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet. It was distributed to anyone who had need. So yes, there's 100 people, there's 100 homes. If there's 100 uh, moms, there you go. They did renounce all. They did. I mean, they, their name was still on the deed, but if something, a need came up, they all felt responsible to meet that need. If you want to see how this has worked out in the, in these days, when you get home, Google, uh, don't do it now with your phone, uh, R.G. Laterno. Just Google that name. You'll find a, a gentleman who he said, you know what, God has blessed me. I can't give God 10%. I only need 10%. I'm going to give God 90%. He started Laterno College, by the way. Uh, Google Stanley Tam. He's still alive. He's 106 years old. He wrote a book called God Owns My Business. He actually had lawyers draw it up, and God is the owner of his business. He's just a steward. It was, the, the story is incredible because the lawyers and the judges are like, God can't own your business. <laughs> and he said, well, we're going to make it happen. They took this passage, this teaching, at its face value. There is a third and sadly the last stage, and that's exasperation. Exasperation. This is seen, first of all, in the expectation. Jesus was supposed to congratulate this guy. You haven't sinned and done any of these things since you were a kid. Way to go. That's wonderful. Hey, can everybody else take some, a tip from this guy? We got to get him on the speaker tour. Was this a botched evangelistic attempt by Jesus? I mean, did Jesus really muff this up poorly? Because, friends, if this guy walked around today, that, well, this wouldn't happen. What, what happened with Jesus? Nobody would say this to him. He might go through the motions of obedience, which is more like lip service, but he would be fast-tracked into leadership. Instead, his hopes were dashed to pieces. He was sad. And his exasperation was also seen in the exit. He left. He left. How did Jesus let him get away? You know, earlier, Jesus had made a, a statement, blessed is he who doesn't fall away on account of me. It was in the context of John the Baptist, who was in prison, who had a little moment of doubt and sent his disciples, ask Jesus, are you really the one? Wait a minute, John, John the Baptist was the one that said he's the one, and now he was having second thoughts. And Jesus said, blessed is the one who doesn't fall away. In other words, when the teaching gets hard, when the teaching gets confusing, when we're not sure, what, what, wait, what are you saying, Jesus? That we hang on to him. It says that Jesus looked at him and loved him. This is the kind of love that tells the truth. The unmitigated truth, however unpalatable it may be. And it's a kind of love that is disappearing fast and it's almost gone. The love that tells the truth. Jesus would not water down or mitigate the gospel to gain a convert who would not even be a true convert anyway if he did. 
If your definition of Christian love excludes speaking the hard truth, it is not Christian love. And I say that it's disappearing because the Lord has prompted me to speak the truth in love as best I can, and I'm told, shut up. Be quiet. We don't want to hear this. Jesus is not suggesting works righteousness. Give away your money and gain eternal life. That's not what Jesus is saying here. He clearly identifies that saving faith is total, unconditional surrender, and it always, always has ramifications. You don't abdicate the throne and have things stay the same. If you can come to Christ and nothing in your life changes, you didn't come to Christ. But wait, I didn't have a life of, of terrible sin to be saved from. Well, neither did this guy. He was a God-fearing, moral, upright guy who tried to obey God's commands as best he could. It wasn't he? I mean, isn't that what this passage just tells us over and over? Except for one thing. Jesus was not going to direct this guy's life without permission. Jesus had said it before, you can't serve two masters. And Jesus will root out whatever competing masters we have, and he will expel them. Jesus doesn't share the throne with anyone. Isaiah 42, 8, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give, also translated yield, or share my glory to another. Not going to happen. You know, there's, uh, there's something out there called bumper sticker wars. I'm still so new to this PowerPoint. I, just, I realized this morning I could have had these images put up here. But if you drive around enough, you've seen this. There's a fish. The fish symbol is an early Christian symbol going way back to the first, sixth century. And sometimes it'll, it'll have the Greek word in it, but... It's an acrostic for Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. And, and that acrostic spells the Greek word for fish, so it's a fish symbol. Well, that was a bumper sticker, and then some people thought we could get some money out of this, and so they had a fish with legs, and it inside that fish said Darwin. Anybody seen any of these, by the way? Okay. So then there was one where the Jesus fish is eating the Darwin fish with legs. <laughs> and this is a bumper sticker. It's like, it's like an ongoing thing. So these are bumper sticker wars. So I saw one years ago all over the place. It said, Jesus is my co-pilot. Have you ever seen that bumper sticker? Jesus is my co-pilot. That, that sounds great. Wow, I'm going, yeah, good, good job. And then I saw one that said, if Jesus is your co-pilot, switch seats. I thought, oh, wait, yeah, that's, that's actually the way it's supposed to be. <laughs> as nice and as pious as the other one sounds, uh, you ain't the pilot. Jesus is the co-nothing. Co he is everything, or he's not in the plane. So where is the hope? Hope is found in surrender to Christ. He wants it all. Your wealth. Yes, he does want it. Your vocation, your vacation, your family, your future, everything, it now belongs to Jesus. You abdicate it and you become a steward. And he calls the shots and you say, yes, sir, it will be done. And if this is untenable, if this is outrageous or even repugnant, then you are in the same boat as this rich young ruler. And you're grappling with the same thing, which is fine, because we all have to grapple with it. We need to grapple with it. We must be able to say with the Apostle Paul in Galatians 6, 14, may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. A week or so ago, I mentioned earlier in that book of Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ. 
It means I'm dead. Nevertheless, I live. Well, yet not I. Christ lives in me, and the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Total, unconditional surrender. Jesus lives his life through us. He's the one sitting on the throne. So I brought a hymn book. The hymn book I had in the church I grew up in, this, this hymn book was hot off the press when I was a little kid. 1968 is the copyright. Uh, John W. Peterson, who wrote a lot of the hymns in here, was the compiler and editor. And I don't know if this, if you, if this song is ever sung anymore. That's why I brought this book. from the 1800s I surrender all you ever heard of that song I'm going to make I'm going to change one word and this is the problem that the rich young ruler had some to G I know I'm not a singer <laughs> some to Jesus I surrender some to him I freely give I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live I surrender some I surrender some, some to Thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender some. Isn't that touching? Some to Jesus I surrender. Humbly at His feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me, Jesus, take me now. Some to Jesus I surrender. Make me Savior, holy Thine. Let me feel the Holy Spirit truly know that thou art mine. Some to Jesus I surrender. Lord, I give some of myself to thee. Fill me with your love and power. Let your blessings fall on me. I surrender some. That almost sounds sacrilegious to sing it that way. In a few moments, we're going to sing another one. And uh, I told Jared, wow, man, the Lord picked that song because he knew it's going to have the word all in it. And when we sing it, just imagine, just switch the word to some and see how that resonates. It sounds terrible. I surrender some. That's what this guy wanted to do. He was willing to surrender some. I'm sure the list of things that he was willing to surrender was longer than that one deal breaker thing, the one thing that Jesus had to point out. And if it had been something else besides wealth, Jesus would have pointed that out. And that's why this is so relevant to us today. Because there's something on that throne. And you know, we'll, again, I'm speaking to myself. Jesus, sit down. And I haven't sit on the throne. And then I kind of, oh, hi, how's it going, Jesus? <laughs> and kind of just see if I can budge him off just for a little bit. Because I got some big things going, and I don't know if I can trust him to guide me through this. I'm going to have to take the reins back, or in the pilot uh, metaphor, I'm going to have to. Where are you at today? In just a few moments, we're going to share the Lord's Supper together. And uh, in doing that, we should have some time of reflection. And so, uh, so we'll revisit this in just a moment. By the way, most of what I just shared is in this little pamphlet. If you want to take it with you, help you remember what was said, or better still, give it to somebody else to read, if that would help you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this is a hard teaching. Who can, who can handle it? Blessed are those who do not fall away on account of Jesus' hard teaching. You know the heart of each one of us here in the building or watching it. And you know what's sitting on the throne. And we probably do too. We have a, a choice to make. It's going to be some or it's going to be all. Through your spirit, work in us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
in 1 Corinthians 11. The Apostle Paul says, I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, also saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat the bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of our Lord eats and drinks judgment upon himself. The gentlemen are going to distribute these little units here and uh, just as a reminder there's the thinner piece of cellophane reveals the wafer and then you pull the other one off to get to the juice and yes it's like those potato chips bags that are so hard to open and you really yank it and it goes everywhere so please be careful you're gonna take a little shower and juice We should take a moment to just pause for personal reflection so that we are taking the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner. Let's just pause in prayer and listen to the Holy Spirit speak to us. Father, I, I pray that there, are, that there is no one here this morning who is so deceived that they think they're without sin. I've kept them all since I was a child. What else do I lack? And as painful and difficult as it is for you to use that scalpel of your word, we need to have that sin cut out and removed. so that you alone are on the throne. He took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. Father, we thank you so much for the body of your Son broken for us, And the pain, excruciating pain. For no fault of his own that he endured because of us. And so we thank you. We thank you. He said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. same way he took the cup after the supper father we thank you for the precious precious blood of Jesus the only thing that could remove our sin shed for us because of Jesus' love deep and amazing love for us thank you for that he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. As we do our closing song, uh, you can remain seated. Um, just kind of use this time to reflect. Um, have your hearts be in an attitude of worship and prayer. I hear the Savior 
never stay. Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. This is an earning salvation. This is allegiance because of what he did for us. Then what could he possibly ask of us that we wouldn't do in a heartbeat? Let's receive the benediction. To the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Before, before we close, uh, Sam, would you mind coming up here really quick? We have just a small, uh, a small thank you card. A small thank you card and a little gift uh, for you for, for the time that you spent with us. It really means a lot. Um, but we're hoping that this can really touch your heart. Um, you have a, let's say a thesaurus of sorts uh, for the word, uh, the word Bible. Uh, and um, the kids, a lot of these kids out here, uh, colored a bunch of pictures for you. Uh, so we've got things like GPS and lunchbox, bar of soap, roadmap, toolbox, wallet, canteen, mirror, textbook, and matchbook. We didn't get, we didn't get a um, milk jug. We, we didn't have time to get milk jug in this morning, but um, the kids wanted to wanted to share that with you. So 
hopefully that can bless you as much as you've been able to bless us. So, all right, thanks. You're dismissed. Thank you. <laughs>